Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Money Moves. Every Sunday, I talk about one news article that I found interesting about the economy. And this week's news article is, there are too many poor people in the United States. Then I will go over each of my investment accounts, starting with worthy bonds, followed by my taxable lending club account and my IRA with lending club. Then I will go over my Fundrise account and a project update for the Tampa area apartments. Then I will go over my M1 retire account and my higher yield savings account. Then I will finish up my investments with my active options positions. Then I will go over my weekly tracker. And as always, there will be some jelly at the end, which is something I enjoyed outside of the markets. If you have big dreams like buying this seven bed, five bath colonial in Kansas City, Missouri, or if you want to be part of a well-educated financial community, definitely like and subscribe. It was built in 1909, but has been fully modernized, except for some of the awful colors. I'm not sure why people buy tubs like this, probably because I can't afford it. This house is currently on sale for $950,000. To keep your dreams at the front of your mind, like and subscribe. Welcome to the Portfolio Bulletin. Let's get started. So Michael Farr says there are too many poor people in the United States. He starts off by congratulating the top 1, 5, and 10 percent for being better than the other 90 percent. I mean, for being protected from the headwinds facing the other 90 percent of citizens. He says the rich have continued to get richer and most rich people are richer than they were 10 years ago. I think this is fair to say. Most people that are wealthy are generally good with their finances, and if they're not, they don't stay wealthy for very long. He goes on to talk about how, in 2008, the Federal Reserve and federal government injected large amounts of liquidity, totaling in the trillions of dollars into the economy, in order to stave off a financial disaster, which they did successfully do. However, the deficit spending, as well as the low interest rates, which benefited all of the large companies and economy as a whole, did not do very much to support the low-income earners. And I think it would be fair to say that that's basically the same thing that they've been doing right now, and that most of the stimulus money has been going to businesses in order to keep them afloat, despite the fact that they've been giving stimulus checks and some additional unemployment benefits to low-income earners and people who have lost their jobs. He goes on to say that if your economy depends on consumer spending, your consumers need to have money to spend in order to keep the economy flowing. The large injections from the government have created a surge in asset prices, which mainly affect the rich and make them richer. This generally does not affect the average American family that much. Prior to the Rona, unemployment was below 4%, and there were more job openings than there were people seeking a job, which was driving up wages which is a critical step for getting more money into the hands of a large number of Americans. Despite the money printing in 2008 and the current money printing for the RONA, we haven't seen a noticeable rate of inflation. This is because inflation must be driven by spending, and if the people who are getting the money are not spending it, i.e. the richest Americans or the lowest income Americans who need to save that money to be more financially secure, then the spending doesn't take place and therefore we don't get inflation. Now this is the part of the article that really made me want to go over it. The typical political response to all of this information is to blame and tax the rich, which the author mentions is quite humorous because most Americans dream of being rich while simultaneously hating everyone who already is. But the rich are not really the problem in this case. The government policy in taxing the rich might have seemed like a good path, but it really hasn't been successful. Most of that money that's taken in taxation is spent very quickly and has very little sustained effect over the long term. The author argues if that money had at least been spent on infrastructure in terms of building highways and upgrading bridges, at least there would be some long-term effects versus giving it to low-income earners in the form of stimulus. He says while taxing the rich may feel good, it won't raise enough money to put a dent in the economic ills, and he's not saying that higher taxes for the rich are a bad idea, but looking at the numbers, it's just not enough. He says unless those monies are deployed in a way that creates job growth, the problem that has trapped the middle class and the poor will remain unchanged. In my humble and completely correct opinion, 
I believe the solution to this problem is in the hands of companies that can afford to pay above the minimum wage. I think Costco is a great example of this. They already pay above the minimum wage and their CEO salary is only in the hundreds of thousands versus the tens of millions for many other companies that are of equal size. If companies like Costco continue to pay out larger and larger wages, then perhaps we could develop a more sustainable economy. Definitely don't tell me how wrong I am in painstaking detail down in the comments. Before we get into investments, just for reference, the S&P 500 was down 1.86% and it was down 2.23% over the past month. Moving on to my first investment, where the bonds continues to grow at 5% and compound daily. I was withdrawing the interest every single month but as the market continues to tick down, I think I'll leave this money in here for an additional month. If you're interested in buying fully liquid asset-backed bonds that grow at 5%, there is a link in the description that gets you one free bond when you fund your account. Moving on to my taxable lending club account. It went up $25 this week, and that's because one of the notes in the 16 to 30 day late period was paid. Notes in grace period went up by one, and notes in the very late category also went up by one. And then I have another one of those canceling or canceled notes, which again, I assume goes back into my portfolio. I focused on primarily C-note loans for this week. In looking at term, I did slip just below that 75% 60-month loans, so I'll have to stay focused on that going into the next week. My weighted average stayed at 16.55%, and I have over $200 in interest accrued waiting to be paid. This account continues to have a great return at 10.44% annualized. Moving on to my IRA with Lending Club, this account went up almost $20, again because I had a note in grace period that was paid. Another note in grace period went into the 16 to 30 days late period, and then one of my late notes was officially charged off. I focused on A note loans for this week and looking at term, I'm still getting closer to that 50 50 split for this account. Because I focused on A note loans, my weighted average went down to 16.87%, and I'm still waiting on $55 of accrued interest to be paid. This account continues to have an absolutely ridiculous rate of return at 36.85%, and I do suspect that this number will go down in the future. Moving on to my Fundrise account, I did have to change the goal for this account to $475,000 by May of 2040, and that's because I was reading the SEC filing on Fundrise, and it turns out this should not be more than 10% of your overall net worth. Currently, at almost $26,000, Fundrise is getting pretty close to 10% of my overall portfolio, which means I can't contribute to it quite as aggressively, which is why I had to drop down this overall goal. Moving on to a better investment than the Tampa Bay Buccaneers made in Tom Brady. They say in June of 2019, they invested $12.9 million in order to acquire a 262 apartment community in Palm Harbor, Florida. They say renovations were going steady in 2019 and early 2020, and then the Rona emerged, causing renovations to slow down. Once the renovations are complete, they expect the rent per unit to go up by $148, which is roughly a 29% increase. Rent in the occupied units has remained steady, with pay rates between 97 and 98% from April through August. As an investor, this is what you like to see. Since this is an equity investment, the rent collected is received by investors like me in the form of dividends. This is unlike investments that I've mentioned in the past, which were debt investments with fixed rates of return. They go on to restate the fact that this is an equity investment, meaning that we are part owners in the property itself and that we receive our investment income through the payment of rent in the form of dividends. If you're interested in investing in properties like this and many like it, there is a link in the description that, that gets your investment fees waived for the first 90 days. Moving on to my M1 Retire account, I'm down 0.13% this week, which was a little bit over $13. Looking at the month view, I'm only down 0.2%, which is far better than the overall market. Looking at the holdings, tech continues to be one of the weakest sectors after being one of the strongest. Industrials are up 2.69%, then finance fell 2.3%. 
Real estate continues to rise, and surprisingly, telecom also went up this week. My dividend ETFs did outperform the market at 0.09% down. Looking at my dividends for this week, 3M paid out, Main Street Capital, Dover Corp, McDonald's, Next Era Energy, Realty Income, Duke Energy, Home Depot, and Waste Management. Moving on to my higher yield savings account, it was also only down 0.14%, which is a little bit over $20. And then looking at the month view, it's only down 0.05%. Looking at the holdings, VIG was actually up this week, which is pretty surprising. Realty Income was down a little bit over 1.5%. The bonds continue to be stable at these levels. And then all of my dividend-paying ETFs did outperform the market, with DIV being the worst performer at negative 0.11%. Looking at dividends, the only one I received for this account was Realty Income. Moving on to my last investment, my active options positions. As you can see, I'm down 2.75% this week, and it's been pretty choppy, to say the least. Looking at the monthly view, I'm still up 2.26%, which is good since the S&P 500 was down over 2% in the last month. Looking at my active options positions, I do have call credit spreads on most of the FANG stocks because they continue to go down, and I do have put credit spreads as well. So these call credit spreads do protect my downside. AMD is another one of those that's been struggling. Simon Property Group has done very well. CrowdStrike is a tech stock, but it is doing well. Facebook doing less well. Yeti also not doing that well, even though it's not tech. And then Gold is doing pretty well right now. And Barrick Gold, I had to roll this position out because I had already taken most of the profits. Uber, another tech stock that is performing very well. And I'm trying to get out of it for this covered call right here. Moving on to my Tastyworks account. I did take a position in Adobe. The volatility is very high on that stock right now. Bank of America, I'm bullish on that stock as well. Another position in Carnival Cruise. I had to roll this one up again, similar to the other position. Ford stock is doing well. Netflix is going down. This is actually an iron condor. Nike stock, this is an earnings play for next week. Peloton continues to rally this week following its great earnings report. The NASDAQ was down this week. And then Snapchat, I did roll this position this week in order to receive more credit. And then the S&P 500, as I already mentioned, was down this week. Lastly here for this episode, looking at my week-to-week -week tracker, you can see stocks continue to downtrend a little bit. My trading accounts did go up from last week, mostly due to deposits into my Tastyworks account. My REITs went up as well, again, because of my $500 monthly deposit into Fundrise. Lending Club also went up this week, and my cash came up a little bit because I did get paid during this week. Comment down below what you thought of the article and my investments. Definitely like and subscribe if you got any value out of this video. Of course, this is not financial advice. This is all for entertainment purposes. And with that, let's get to the jelly. Today's jelly is the Ford Mustang Mach-E, which Ford made to promote their new electric Mustang. So here's a little bit of their promo video. I think the point of this promo video is to say that Mustangs have been a lot of things over the years, and this is just another addition to the family. Of course, this version of the Mach-E is far more powerful than the production vehicle will be. If you want to watch the full video, it is linked in the description. Comment down below what you thought of this car. Definitely like and subscribe before you go, and have a great day.